and welcome to The Power and the Story, Perspectives on Motorsport History. I am the spectator and this is an opportunity for me to enjoy myself in writing about motorsports and hopefully create something that people out there might enjoy listening to. I want to try and focus on stories from motorsports history rather than get lost in the data. Motorsports tends to be an area where people get lost in lap times. It's kind of the point on one level. But I, I always think that the, the story is more interesting and it's the story that you remember rather than to what tenth of a second a given driver completed a given lap. So if you've made it even this far, then first of all, thank you. But also, I have to assume that you are a fan of motorsports, much like myself. But do you ever wonder how you got to this point? I certainly do. What does it take to make a motorsports fan? It's a question that seems to be asked a lot within the industry at the moment, particularly given the rise of the current situation with the bug. It's more important than ever to make fans and keep fans. And it seems everybody's asking it from local motorsport to amateur motorsport to the big wigs of Liberty Media who are, you know, continuing to push to get Formula One to even more dizzying heights. Now, while they try to do that, while they look at their reports and look at their numbers and their income. I find myself looking backwards. Probably not surprising given, you know, the, the whole point of this podcast. But I think back to how, you know, me, people like me, people like you, were drawn to motorsport in the first place. Now, understandably, the decision makers in the sport are looking at the demographics of the people paying for the sport, be that directly through race tickets, television subscriptions, or through the sponsors who ultimately have to sell products and services to those very fans. But I think one crucial thing is missing. If you visit any significant race meeting, you'll see tons of youngsters with their parents wandering about taking in the, the, the sights and sounds and smells of motorsport. Now, to be fair, a lot of those kids aren't paying much attention. But a lot of them are. If one looks at the gaming sections of YouTube, for example, there are a load of motorsport streamers out there, all with vibrant communities of fans supporting them. Now, it's not just motorsport, it's not just top-level motorsport. In a lot of those cases, the communities are probably more important than the motorsport simulations that they play. But I think the point is that the fans are out there. They just need to be engaged and cultivated until they reach the age, and let's be honest, the financial firepower to pay up front for their interest in the sport, at which point the stakeholders will notice them <laughs> appear on their spreadsheet. I think motorsport keeps trying to create scenarios to woo fans into the sport, yet I think we can see from those examples that it doesn't necessarily work, and I think that new motorsport fans find their own reasons to get interested and to get excited about the sport. You know, I mean, how did it happen for you? Admittedly, as you can't shout through your podcast player at me, um, it's probably better that I share my story, um, which has been ongoing now for over 25 years. It's, it's, my, it's the only sport that I follow, and I, I still love it to bits. Now, I've been a motorsports nerd for 25 years, but I think the moment that turned me from a reasonably casual fan of the sport into the kind of motorsports 
nerd that sits before you recording a podcast can come down really to one event. And I think that event was the first 25 laps of the 1995 Japanese Grand Prix. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, I now realise my first memory of, of motorsport was actually Nigel Mansell's tyre blowout at the 1986 Australian Grand Prix. All I can remember is our family sat around the television and just the, the, the sparks and the, the car snaking its way down that back straight, eventually coming to a halt just in front of the camera position. If I'm honest, memories after that are a little bit sketchy. Um, I remember watching McLarens circulating together on a, a decrepit black and white portable TV that I'd spent about half an hour tuning in. Remember that? <sighs> Again, I was happy just to see racing cars, um, but didn't really understand anything about what was actually going on. Of course, now I understand that was likely the, the Senna and Prost domination of 1988 and 1989. Um, but to me, it was just two McLarens circulating in grayscale on a tiny TV. I suppose like many parents across the world, um, my folks realised that putting the Grand Prix on the TV on a Sunday afternoon was a great way to keep a uh, little spectator quiet. Um, so whenever it was discovered that a race was on, I would get a call of, racing cars are on TV, and downstairs I would run and, and take my place in front of our little 14-inch colour TV, and I think that was how it started, you know. Just more and more of that and slowly understanding the sport um, as I happily watched it on probably, you know, a hundred Sunday afternoons. I must have done this consistently for a couple of years because I, I, I now understand that by the time we get to 1991, um, I'm an active kind of armchair enthusiast and I understand roughly what's going on. Um, my next memory is of, ironically, uh, Mansell losing a wheel um, in the pit lane at the uh, 91 Portuguese Grand Prix. The interesting part of this, though, is by the point that that wheel comes off the Williams FW14, I knew three things while watching the incident unfold before my eyes. Number one, it was amazing to see, and I'd never seen anything like that before. Number two... I knew it was really bad for Nigel Mansell's championship chances. And number three, I was relatively sure, even at my relatively young years, that you weren't allowed to conduct a pit stop in the fast lane of the pits. That's quite an advance in knowledge from, you know, where I started five years before that. By the time Nigel Mansell embarked on his championship year in 1992, I was fully invested, uh, both emotionally and in terms of time. I can remember so much from that year firsthand. Obviously, my parents had picked up on this because that Christmas I got a load of racing related bits and pieces, books, videos. In particular, I got the full series of the BBC documentary programme, The Power and the Glory on VHS videotape. As I sit here now, I'm so thankful that I got that gift. Of course, this is a pre-internet world, and until I discovered Autosport magazine in my teenage years, this is all I had to fill in the blanks of, of what motorsport was and why it was so good. The videotape contained all the 30-minute episodes of the programme that was originally broadcast on BBC TV, and I would watch them in bite-sized chunks around, well, probably episodes of The Simpsons. It was the early 90s, after all. Our family had recently acquired its first PC, so I was avidly playing the accolade titles, World Circuit, Test Drive, the original David Kamer, title of Indianapolis 500, and eventually F1 GP, 
which was the first episode of the amazing Jeff Crammond series of Formula One games. In addition to being an avid fan of the original Top Gear, remember that, I was watching Rally Report sporadically on TV, and when Nigel Mansell went to IndyCar for 1993, the shows being broadcast late night in the UK were so entertaining, my folks were not only recording it for me, but watching it themselves and reporting back that I really need to make sure that I watch those tapes. To them, IndyCar racing was a revelation. The acquisition of The Power and the Glory helped explain all these motorsport disciplines and tie them all together with a historical context. In one go, I had a basic working knowledge of pre-war Grand Prix. Formula One from 1950 to the present day, which then would have been 1990. So nowadays, that's actually quite a, a nice historical nugget in itself. There were shows on the Indy 500, on NASCAR, on the history of rallying, Le Mans, with occasional focus on specific subjects within the sport, like the inherent danger. Those red cars, which covered the Italian manufacturers so important in the early years of motorsport, and particularly post-war motorsport and shows on the, the challenge to those red cars, namely the, the, the British uh, garagiste of the 1960s. For my part, I sucked it all up like a sponge. It was an astonishing thing to learn. And um, I think it's fair to say I've never quite got over it. As far as Formula One was concerned, it had looked the same for my entire time following it, with roughly the same drivers in roughly the same cars and those cars look roughly the same. Yes, Nigel and Williams were my heroes, but I was aware of the yellow car with the strange nose and an exciting young German driving for them. He was driving alongside a battling Englishman, another local hero to support. But something still didn't make sense to me. For example, how can a nondescript team run by some bloke called Frank or a team owned by a jumper shop can build cars that can go faster than the best cars in the world. Ferrari, as I thought at the time, and their promising lady driver called Jean. McLaren were always the enemy, and it would take many years for me to find a reason to support them. Clearly, I still had a lot to learn. Into 1993 we went, and I was with, without my hero. But I was gladly supporting Damon Hill, whose bloodline I knew only too well thanks to my documentary analysis. I knew Graham's achievements, and I knew why it was a cool story to see Damon in the sport, and I was happy to throw the weight of my support behind him. I must have still been watching avidly, as I clearly remember many things from that year. I don't remember Senna's dominance of the 93 European Grand Prix, but I do remember him waving at his unorganised team in the pit lane. I remember thinking that Hill's first win in Hungary was fitting, given it was also the place where Mansell won his title 12 months beforehand. I was very happy to see Jean Alesi, I now realise that he was a man, get P2 at Monza, with the luckless Michael Andretti in P3. Even at this age, I would have been about 12 at the time, I was unwilling to say that Andretti was unsuitable for F1, as many were saying at the time in the media and outside of it. My knowledge of IndyCar told me that it was it was unfair to label him that, because IndyCar is a difficult thing to, to race in. That was the power and the glory working for me again. Berger dropping the Ferrari on the exit of the pit lane in Estoril, and somehow the driver's going flat chat down the straight, missing him. Again, a lasting memory of the year. It wasn't all that bad. For 1994, though, everything seemed to change. I mean, for starters, all the leading cars were different colours, and Ferrari had ditched that troubling white stripe for a gorgeous classical livery that was much more a nod to the 60s than to the increasing support from Philip Morris. What with that and, and the nemesis of Williams, that would be the guy in the yellow helmet, 
actually driving for Williams rather than against it, my interest was further amped up. I can remember just looking at articles in magazines and seeing that yellow helmet in that blue car and just after everything I'd known beforehand, it was just a, a total shock to the system. Perhaps unsurprisingly, my next memory is Imola. Watching that medical helicopter land on the circuit, fearing the worst after the events of, of Saturday and and when being asked to go with my dad to pick up my nan for Sunday lunch, refusing in the strongest way a 13-year-old could. Sadly, nothing was peeling me away from the drama coming through the TV screen, even if it was an increasingly desperate picture. Later on, hearing the grim news, unfortunately, I can remember walking around the house, looking out of windows and just being incredulous at what I had seen. It was astonishing at the time, especially as it was my introduction to the, the darker side of the sport. I wasn't a, a, a fan of Senna. As I've said, from my perspective, he'd been the enemy for, for all the time I'd been watching motorsport. But just the shock of, of seeing that happen on live TV, it seemed the dark stories that I had learned watching my videotapes were back on the agenda. One way or another, 1994 was a breath of fresh air for the sport. A big change had taken place. Some of it was positive. Some of it was very unfortunate. But my dedication to watching the rest of that season was guaranteed. Cheering Damon Hill and Williams, but also marvelling at John Lacey fighting both his competitors and that scarlet banshee that was the 4-1-2-T1 with its glorious 3.5 litre V12. The German Grand Prix was the highlight for me. Verstappen and the Benetton team surviving a pit fire virtually unscathed. And Gerhard Berger rebuffing Schumacher until the German eventually retired. I'd never seen a Ferrari win a Grand Prix in the time I'd been watching F1. So to see that banshee come across the line with a German-speaking driver winning on, on German soil was astonishing. It was a great thing to watch. Of course, my hero, Nigel Mansell, had made the odd appearance, but at the end of the season, he was back for the final three races. And while I was a little perturbed that, you know, my hero was a little behind the two guys at the front of the field, just the, the whole situation was just utterly engrossing for my, my young motorsport mind. Then we got to Suzuka and the famous race won by Damon Hill. I think it's widely believed that it was his greatest victory. For me, it definitely is. For me, though, the, the overriding memory of that race is my old and new heroes battling for lap after lap to try and get on the podium. Mansell was harrying Alacy for much of the race, leading to some fantastic camera footage that, um, if you've seen it, I'm sure you'll remember too. To my immense satisfaction, <laughs> it's a satisfaction that still lasts to this day, they both won. They both beat each other. Mansell sent it into the chicane on the last lap to beat Alacy on the road. Alacy, however, had been faster in the first half of the race and therefore ended up on the podium overall. I think it was fitting that they both embraced each other in Parc Ferme, having genuinely enjoyed the battle. Alacy was moved to tell Mansell, You are crazy, but very quick for an old man. Well, if they were happy, I was in orbit. With the controversy of Adelaide and the, the feel-good old-timer podium of Mansell, Berger and Brundle, I was well up for the 1995 season. I couldn't wait for it to get underway. As we enter 1995, Ferrari ramped up the pressure on my emotions by designing one of the most beautiful Grand Prix cars of all time. The 412T2 featured the classic livery and it retained a low nose while most of the cars had gone the, the high nose route following Benetton and originally Tyrrell's lead. It was the last F1 car to feature a V12 engine and that 3 litre V12 as it now was with the 95 regulations was a true screamer. 
The car was also reasonably unreliable, but that was another thing entirely. As the season progressed, I really did find myself tiring of Hill's unsuccessful struggle to try and beat Schumacher and Benetton to the championship. Benetton now had a Renault engine and were really on top of their game. I found myself more and more looking to see where Alessi was in the standings. Whenever we cut to him on track, it was it was a, a heady mix of, of noise, blurred hands, scarlet bodywork and just just fun. He took a lucky first win in Canada, at Schumacher's expense it must be said. The win was just reward really. Alessi had been so close to, to victories in 1994 um, and even earlier in 1995 had had some, you know, some great races. He really was due a good result. Alessi had come close to winning at Monza in 1994, only for the car to let him down in front of an adoring Tifosi, um, something which Alessi took really to heart. And there are stories of him um, leaving the circuit straight away and driving home to Nice at great speed. Um, one of those stories that kind of goes into folklore. In 1995 at Monza, Alessi had another great chance of victory and was leading by a country mile late in the race. But again, I believe it was a rear wheel bearing, failed and put him out of the race again. And this time, you know, it was kind of par for the course and nobody was really surprised, but still another opportunity to win in front of the adoring Tifosi that just went up in smoke, literally. There was also a near miss at the Nürburgring, um, an inspired drive by LAC on, on slicks in wet but drying conditions, had left him again in the lead late in the race. Unfortunately, he was a victim of an even more inspired drive by Michael Schumacher, who managed to get past him with a couple of laps to go to win in front of his adoring fans. This took us to Suzuka. Now, from the previous years, anybody paying attention knew that Alessi was good in changing weather conditions. But what was to come at Suzuka during that Japanese Grand Prix was something else entirely. Now, given the race was shown in the UK in the early hours of Sunday morning, I settled down to watch a recording of the race on the following Monday evening um, after dinner and with my old man snoozing in his armchair. Um, I was actually able to find that original VHS recording of it and uh, transfer it to, to DVD some years ago, um, which I was able to dig out uh, in preparation for this very podcast. So I was able to watch the exact same recording and, and just, just take in that mid-90s charm. So, we press play, and the first thing that happens is we get that famous rendition of Fleetwood Mac's The Chain. Anchoring the show was Steve Ryder, whose dulcet tones I didn't realise I missed until I watched that recording. This being mid-90s BBC, there's very little introductory um, information and introductory footage, and it's, it's a case of getting straight to the action, thankfully I must say. Um, with the inimitable Murray Walker, um, who was supported at this point by Jonathan Palmer. Wow, it really is 1995. The track was wet, but beginning to dry. And as the cars sat on the grid, Schumacher on pole with a lacy second. Notable absences were Blundell and Suzuki, who had both had big accidents in practice and qualifying. There are a couple of incidents at the back of the grid, but the field gets away largely intact and begins to circulate in the slippery conditions. Almost immediately, Alessi and Berger are given jump start penalties. Alessi comes in on lap five to serve his at the end of the pit lane. Remember when teams used to do that? He rejoins in P10. Any chance to use his skills to hold on to Schumacher in the conditions has seemingly gone at this point. Two laps later, though, Alessi is back in, and this time for slicks. He's back out in P10, but relative to Schumacher, is even further behind now. At the pit exit, the Ferrari visibly breaks traction, and it frankly, it looks like it's trying to kill the driver. But Jean being Jean, he catches it and gets on his way. Already, I'm 
absolutely transfixed by this race. Now, whether it's just by design or coincidence, the only way to make these slicks work in such slippery conditions is, like nowadays, to get heat into them immediately by going technically faster than you can and hoping it's all going to turn out all right. <laughs> so in other words, a lacy territory. Jean is immediately on it, hands a blur, glorious V12 wailing its way around the Suzuka track. Exiting the final chicane, Alessi gets overzealous in trying to clear Pedro Lamy's Minardi on the outside. The Minardi is completely unrealising of where Alessi is, and he runs the 27 Ferrari clear off the track. <laughs> Alessi does a total 360, covers the car in mud, and ends up pointing the right way on the track again. He continues, the car is muddy, the tyres are muddy, but all is seemingly still well. He's now P15. What a race. It's only lap 8. Now, I'm aware that I'm already breaking my own rules, but LAC completes lap 9 with the fastest lap at that point, and it's important. 7 seconds faster than Schumacher on wets, who has been minding his own business and is leading the race at this time. Uh, it's clear from activity in the pits that Benetton panics. Schumacher pits. Alessi now gets into a rhythm and starts delivering consistently uh, faster than anybody else. Um, Barrichello, himself a tidy wet weather driver, is also on slicks and stopped at pretty much the same time as Alessi. Alessi is still going five seconds a lap quicker. Alessi catches, in this race anyway, the hapless Damon Hill and overtakes him around the outside into the final chicane. Sideways. Both cars are on slicks. At this point, Murray Walker and Jonathan Palmer are absolutely stunned. Hakkinen chooses this moment uh, to come into the pits from P2 and take a pit stop. Now, given the qualities of the 95 McLaren, Hakkinen is also performing extremely well, but is largely not even focused on during this race. Hakkinen's pit stop means that Alacy has recovered his P2 already. It's still only lap 12. With Schumacher now on slicks, the job becomes a lot harder. Um, we keep cutting to onboard shots with Alacy, and some of the saves he is making is leaving Jonathan Palmer speechless. The gap comes down and down and down and down and down, and I'm, I notice that the drivers are racing past uh, spent cars abandoned at the side of the track. I have to confess that while that is something that Formula 1 abandoned a long time ago, I can't actually pin down when they started doing it. Alessi continues to reduce the gap to Schumacher, and now it appears to be about two seconds. At this point there are no further excuses. It seems that Alessi is just simply driving the Ferrari quicker than Schumacher can drive the Benetton. Jonathan Palmer guesses that Lacey has lost about 50 seconds, plus a spin, to Michael in this time. That kind of crystallises exactly what Lacey was doing during the race. With the gap between the two hovering at about two seconds, um, our attention is now drawn to some other matters in the race. Barrichello's charge ends when he spins, breaking for the chicane, and so nearly takes off his teammate, Eddie Irvine. Berger has to retire the other Ferrari. Clearly fed up, he throws his gloves at the back of the garage wall. It seems that Ferrari reliability may be rearing its ugly head. The gap between Alacy and Schumacher is still two seconds. Michael is finally getting on top of things, and the gap is toing and froing depending on lap traffic. It takes till lap 23 for Schumacher to complete a lap quicker than the following Alacy. And then on the run down to Spoon Curve on lap 25, we see smoke starting to pour from the back of Alacy's Ferrari. Here we go again. Alacy freewheels up to 130R and eventually pulls off the track. Yet again, his day is done. All that happened in just 25 laps, and I am now a die-hard fan of Formula 1. Tellingly, whether it be 1995 or 2021, I kind of lose interest in the race after this point. Schumacher strokes it home for a win. 
Hakkinen maintained P2 until the finish, which, given the 95 McLaren, was an amazing performance in itself. Herbert finishes P3 for Benetton ahead of Irvine for Jordan. Benetton stole the Constructors' Championship from Williams. Um, a combination of oil from uh, Denise's 40 that had expired at Spoon Curve and gravel on the track led to Hill going off twice at Spoon, uh, the second time for good. Coulthard had an incident at Spoon as well and then ended up crashing on his own gravel at 130R uh, when it all decided to um, leave the side pods in undignified fashion. Let's leave it at that. All in all, 1995 was a terrible year for the boys from Didcot. For me, I read about the review of the race in Autosport magazine, of which I had recently become a buyer, and um, never looked back from that point. Um, I was a particular fan of Nigel Roebuck's fifth column, and um, nowadays very much miss his journalistic efforts in the sport. As the season moved into the winter testing phase, um, we were faced with a game of musical chairs between drivers and teams rarely seen to this level in F1, uh, with many teams not only changing lineups, but also agreeing to release drivers early so they could get their first runs in the uh, respective cars. Um, I still remember buying F1 News End of Season Special, um, a magazine which I'm shocked to find I still possess and have just looked through. Um, with a photo collage named The Shape of Things to Come, with what was, to my eyes at the time at least, astonishing images from Estoril testing of Berger and Lacey in the Benetton, Kart champion and Indy 500 winner Jacques Villeneuve and O'Williams. Um, several stories there that could be um, delved into in just one sentence, I think you'll uh, agree. And uh, Michael Schumacher driving a V10 equipped version of the Ferrari. Times were indeed changing. Uh, with the rise of Photoshop, I think that uh, we're quite used now to seeing, um, you know, new drivers in new outfits and new liveries and new cars. Um, and I don't think I'd ever be able to explain to a, a newer F1 fan or a fan of F1 in the modern generation just how exciting it was to see these images that would just, just, you know, send your mind crackers for a few seconds while you processed what you were seeing. Great times. I think many of us are only realising now that that era of F1, um, in various guises, but from 1989 to 1997, um, pre the 98 rule changes of groove tyres and narrow track, really was a good era for the sport. And um, I'm glad I was kind of activated as a fan for, you know, a good six years of it. You know, although my hero Mansell was long retired, um, I had had a Lacey for a good number of years to follow. And, um, you know, although his star waned after a couple of difficult years at Benetton and then, you know, the inevitable slide down the grid, um, it provided me with like a launch pad that I felt that I, as a result, I fell in love with F1. Um, and that kept me going deep in, into the Schumacher era um, of the early 2000s. Um, it was only really when Schumacher was crushing everything in, you know, maybe 2002, 2003, uh, that I started to kind of, you know, lose a bit of interest. During this era, my first experiences of live F1 uh, took place as well. Um, I had visits to the 1997 and 1998 British Grand Prix. Um, I can still remember my first ever sight and sound of real F1 cars. And that would be uh, Coulthard and Irvine circulating in close proximity on their installation laps. Um, I can just remember thinking, how could a device that was so small make so much noise? And also, the livery seemed so much brighter and more colourful, even gaudy, compared to even how they seemed on TV. So, although F1 had been my entry point to the sport... Um, it, it wasn't the only horse in town by any means. By the time we get to the mid-late 1990s, um, we were experiencing golden eras for both kart, um, effectively IndyCar racing um, after the split, and uh, super touring. Um, while the, also the, the World Rally Championship was, was building nicely in Group A, um, and we had the, that kind of 90s era of McRae and Burns and Mackinnon and Impressas and Evos, and um, I think that's a golden era as well now. 
as a family, we required satellite TV um, in the mid-90s too, meaning that not only could I follow IndyCar races, but also start to develop an interest in Le Mans coverage. Um, certainly in the 90s, it was the only way to see road sport of that nature. Um, and I ended up stuck to my TV screen for weekend after weekend. You know, it's it's it was the start of a long journey of following motorsport, which, although kind of tripped up by the bug, um, it continues unabated. I still love it. And I really don't see why others, even younger generations, can't love it too. All that I think motorsport really needs to do is not erect barriers to entry for these interested or potentially interested fans. I really don't see how the logic of putting motorsport behind paywalls works when we're also trying to attract new viewers to the sport. Obviously, ticket prices don't help either. Another thing that really doesn't help is the instant censorship on social media of anybody trying to find a cool moment, create a clip, or create some kind of motorsport-based uh, homage based on official footage. This stuff is yeeted from the internet almost straight away, and it always seems to me that what better way could you find to extinguish the kind of beginnings of interest in motorsport than doing that to a new fan? How about, rather than standing around waiting to empty a new fan's wallet, how about the sport actually invests in that new fan by letting potential fans peek into the sport and share moments that they think are cool with each other? Is it really that much to ask? Motorsport didn't make me a fan. It just did what it did and allowed me to watch it. For what it was worth, I jumped in with both feet and either through paying attention at the time or through my becoming a fan of motorsports history, I now have thousands of great memories that took place on racetracks, street circuits, rally stages, oval tracks in races all over the world. Those stories mean something, and frankly, they're stories that I'd like to share with you. So, circling, that's what this podcast will aim to do. Share stories from motorsport past and present with a focus on the story. Because lap times make stories, not the other way around. So if you've made it this far, then I really do extend my great thanks um, for sticking with me and getting through this rather shaky uh, first attempt at podcasting. Um, I'm not sure whether there's anything for a wider audience to enjoy about this, but um, I've really enjoyed creating the notes and doing a little bit of research to get to this point. So I think I'm going to carry on. Um, I hope to learn from this episode and have something more for you very soon. Thank you for listening. This was The Power and the Story. <laughs>